So today I want to continue a series that we began last week that we have entitled Winning Season. Somebody say this after me. Say, it is, it is my, winning season. my winning season. Somebody say that again by faith. Say, it is, it is my, my winning season. If you're in the building, if you got anybody around you, I want you to look to your left, and I want you to tell them, hey, say, neighbor, neighbor. It, is it is your winning season, and it's your winning season right now. It is your winning season, not tomorrow, not next week. As a child of God, it is your winning season right now. Our series theme is we're learning how to win over the adversities of life. This is lesson number two of a four-part teaching series. Y'all ready? We about to get started. We about to get started. Oh, I'm ready for this word. I don't know about y'all, but I am ready. Hold on. We're going to get started in just a second. Can I have a drink of water? Okay. Amen. 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 Ron, we're getting ready to get started in a second. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's a good lesson. Amen. It's a good lesson. Y'all ready? Yes. My prayer is that you're not just going to hear me. I believe you're going to hear the Holy Spirit. Yes. But we're getting ready to get started in just a second. I, I'm sorry, I drunk a little coffee in the back. I'm a little parched. Let me get, let me get some more water. She said, take my time. I'm going to take my time. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Winning season. Somebody say it is. It is. My winning season. My winning season. I don't think I want some water. Give me that. I need a little kick. <laughs> it's winning season. It's winning season. I'm thirsty. You mind if I? You, you mind if I? She said, no, nah, no. Nah. Hold on, I need. Let me come over to this side, because they, they weren't really with, with it. I like your hat. I like it. Match your outfit. I'm, I'm thirsty. Do you mind if I? No, do you mind? It, but don't take the top off. Do you mind if I if I get a switch? Okay, she said she said no. I don't need that. I don't need that. Now I was thirsty. Okay. Hand me that. I was thirsty. Okay. And when I shook this bottle up and opened up the top, nobody had a problem. Nobody sat back in their seat. Nobody shook their head. <laughs> but when I opened up, when I tried to open up yeah. this, I had a different reaction. Come on now. And my question is, why? What's the difference? Somebody said carbonation. That's a good answer. <laughs> Ooh, y'all smart. Somebody said carbonation. <laughs> They're both plastic bottles. They both can quench my thirst. The reason that the congregation responded differently to this soda bottle and me shaking it than how they did with me shaking it, this water bottle is because of how this soda bottle will respond to pressure. There's liquid in both, but because of what's on the inside, there's a completely, dramatically different response. You got a lot of Christians that go to church. A lot of Christians that can quote scripture. They have the Holy Spirit living down on the inside of them. But some believers 
respond to pressure like this. Some believers in the same church, reading the same Bible, respond to pressure like this. I got just one question for you, Faith Chapel. Which one of these are you? Now, I know you're going to say, ooh, Pastor, I'm that water bottle. <laughs> Listen, I, I am that water bottle. We don't want to just talk good. We don't want to just give cute, pat, right answers in church. God can help you wherever you are, but he cannot help you with where you're pretending to be. So I want you to be honest. I want you to be honest. We're not in, in church playing games. Which one are you really? When you got pressure on you at work, do you respond like this? When you got pressure in your circumstances, do you take that out on your family at home? Do we think that you're like this at church? But if we were to get your kids up here, they give us the real. Here's what I need for you to understand. Pressure is an unavoidable part of life. Pressure is not something as believers, as Christ followers, that we can just pray our way out of, pray one prayer, and God remove all of the pressure. Pressure is an unavoidable part of life. A lot of us are praying and asking God for promotion. Bless me. Enlarge my territory. And he wants to. He wants to. God, raise me up. God, it's my winning season. Cause me to be the head, not the tail. God, give me greater influence. I am saying that God has greater influence for you. It is God's will to elevate you. God does want you to be the head. God doesn't want you to be the tail. God does want you to be in positions of influence. He wants you to be in bigger rooms. He wants you to sit in bigger seats. But the higher that you go up, the greater the pressure is going to be. God can't answer that prayer. God, elevate me, but keep the pressure the same. When you get in that airplane, the pilot takes off. He or she goes higher and higher and higher. The pressure changes. As you go higher and higher in your career, as you go higher and higher in your purpose, the pressure is going to change. There are different kinds of pressure. There's pressures at work. There's pressures in our circumstances. There's time-related pressures. As a believer, you are not exempt from pressure, but you do have an advantage. I have three girls. My wife and I have three girls. They're over across the street in our children's facility at Faith Chapel Kids with some of your kids. And all of the kids over there in those classrooms have equal value. All of the kids over there in our Faith Chapel classrooms have equal worth. My kids are no more valuable than yours. In the eyesight of God, my kids don't have greater worth than yours. They're all created in the image of God. Equal value, equal worth. But here in Faith Chapel, because of my kid's last name All right. All right. and because of who their father is, Come on now. there are some advantages that they have with being in what we call the first family. There are some rooms that they can go in that every kid in the church can't go in. There are some snacks that they can access. <laughs> 
that every kid just can't go in and access. Why? Because of who their father is. And when my kids get a revelation of who they are, and when my kids get an understanding of who their father is, there'll be a confidence down on the inside of them. They'll walk boldly into the room, walk boldly into my refrigerator, just grabbing stuff, grabbing snacks. I am saying, believer, that pressure is an unavoidable part of life, but your father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Your father is the alpha, your father is the omega. Every human being on the planet has equal value. Every human being on the planet has equal worth. We're all equal in the, in the eyesight of God from a value standpoint, from a worth standpoint. But as a part of God's family, you have some advantages because of who your father is. And when you get a revelation of the advantages that you have, your confidence is different. You'll find yourself in the middle of pressure, but you'll understand the advantage that you have. It's important that we understand how to respond properly because your level of success in life is going to be determined by your capacity to handle pressure. The influence that God is gonna be able to entrust you with. God has bigger platforms that he wants to give you on. God has more resources that he wants you to command, but it's capacity to get you where he wants you to be. Doing what he wants you to do at the level that he intended is gonna be determined by your capacity to handle pressure. So in this second lesson, I wanna teach from this title, a winning response to pressure. It's winning season, but we have some responsibilities. How we respond when we have pressure on us matters. A winning response to pressure. In order to respond properly, to pressure, we have to first know what it is. We have to know what it is. So let's define our terms. What is pressure? Pressure is the need to act in the face of important and uncertain circumstances. Keep that definition up for me. Pressure is the need to act in the face of important and uncertain circumstances. We're gonna break this down, keep it up. Pressure is the need to act. When I have it on me, when you have it on me, we feel a need to do something. It's a little different than grief. When I'm feeling grief, I may feel, the grief because of death, I may feel a little disoriented. I may feel some instances of shock. Okay, is this real? Is this real? I may feel anger. I may not feel like doing anything. Grief is gonna have a lot of emotions and sometimes grief can motivate me to do nothing. It's a little different than fear. When I'm feeling a feeling of fear, if I don't manage it properly, fear can paralyze me. Okay, I don't feel adequate enough. I don't feel like I know enough. I don't feel like I have what it takes down on the inside. I'm afraid of failing. I'm afraid of nobody showing up. I'm afraid of not seeing the outcome. I am afraid of starting but not being able to finish. So because of my fears, I just won't do anything. Fear can paralyze me, but when I'm feeling pressure, I'm feeling this need to do something, okay? I gotta respond some kind of way, and I'm feeling this need to respond because of two things. My circumstances are important, but uncertain. Pressure, let's continue to define it. Pressure in your life 
is gonna be created at the intersection of importance and uncertainty. To have pressure, we're gonna have to have both coming together, and pressure is gonna show up where those two things meet. Team, you can go to the next graphic. I know none of you gamble anymore. I know none of y'all gamble anymore. You've been redeemed. But just flash back for a moment on when you did, when you were buying the lottery ticket. Okay, if you bought the $5 lottery ticket, whether or not you were going to win the lottery is highly uncertain. It's a good chance you're probably not going to win. So we meet a part of the criteria, it's highly uncertain, but it's a $5 ticket. We don't win the lottery, we lose the $5, that's not highly important. There's not gonna be a lot of pressure to win based on that ticket. But let's flip the circumstance. Our mortgage on our house is due. We've gotten letter after letter, you're behind on your payment. Having a house to stay in is highly important. And if we're not certain where we're going to get the money from to pay the past due bills, All right. we now have a circumstance that's highly important but highly uncertain. I am saying that that is a high-pressure situation. You are in school. You have to take an exam. The score that you get on this exam determines a lot. It can determine what colleges look at us. It can determine what scholarships we may or may not get. Highly important. You've studied, but you don't know what question is going to be on this exam. Yeah. It's highly uncertain. Pressure is always going to show up at the intersection of two things. When the circumstances are highly important and highly uncertain. And usually whenever you find yourself, you can take it down, team, whenever you find yourself in a pressure situation, there's going to be something that triggers it. There's going to be some type of pressure trigger. And when that pressure trigger happens, you are going to feel the need to respond. How am I going to respond? What are we going to do? I want to encourage you to put some distance, to put some space in between that pressure trigger and your response. Team, put up the next slide for me. We got a pressure trigger, something that's now triggered pressure. It's important. We're not sure how this thing going to turn out. We got to respond. We got to make a decision. We have to act. I am saying that there's going to be a space of time in between those two things. Space of time may differ depending on the circumstance. A lot of times we can choose how long that space is. I am also saying that what you choose to do in between that trigger and your response is going to matter. Amen. It's going to matter a lot. What does a winning response look like? How do we get to a winning response? I want to encourage you in that space, in between the trigger and the response, take a moment. It doesn't have to be an hour. Take a moment to pause and pray. Amen. Holy Spirit, you said in the Word, and James said, if I lack wisdom, I can ask you. You said that if I ask, you'll give it to me liberally. You won't just give me a little bit, and you'll give it to me without reproach. You're not going to fuss at me for not knowing what to do. Holy Spirit, on my own, I am not sure which route to take. On my own, I'm not sure what the proper response in this situation looks like. I don't know where I'm going to get the resources from. I don't know how to handle it. Holy Spirit, this feels bigger than me. But you said in your word, in all of my ways, 
acknowledge you. In all of my ways, acknowledge that you have a position. In all of my ways, acknowledge that I am not the only one who has some thoughts. You have some thoughts. Holy Spirit, I'm acknowledging you. As I respond, help me. As I respond, lead me. As I respond, guide me. Cause me to be in the center of your will. The moment that we pray that prayer, we use wisdom. We've acknowledged him, we've done our part. Now, what is wisdom telling me to do? Is this a decision that's gonna affect a lot of people? If it's gonna affect a lot of people, I need some counsel. I don't wanna just wing it. If I make the wrong decision, I can hurt a lot of people. What does wisdom now tell me to do? Here's what taking time to pause and pray is gonna help you with. It's gonna help you, number one, to get your emotions under control. This is real cute when we're in this sanctuary. This is real cute when it's a lesson. When it's real pressure, when it's really important, your emotions are going to feel all over the place. Because on the surface, we don't really know. Now, we trust in God, but internally, we don't really know how this is going to play out. By pausing and praying, it gives us a second to get our emotions under control. It also increases the chances of us responding spiritually. Your team doesn't just need you. They don't need you fleshing out. They don't need you panicking. They need a spiritual response. Taking time to pause and pray is going to help us and increase the likelihood of a more rational and a more spiritual response. Okay, Pastor MK, make this practical. Tell me what to do. I got pressure on me. It's real pressure. How do I make sure that my response is a winning response? I've prayed the prayer, but nothing in my circumstances have changed. I've asked the Holy Spirit to help me. I still don't know what to do. How do I respond? How do I get to a winning response? I want to give you three keys to responding well under pressure. The first key is this. I want you in the circumstance, in the middle of it. We're not at church. I want you to remind yourself of what is certain. It's a lot about this scenario that is uncertain. But even in this adversity, even in this circumstance, even in this pressure, pressure situation, there are some things that are certain. And a part of us responding well is us taking some time to remind ourselves of those things. What are those things that are certain, Pastor MK? No matter what you are facing in life, no matter how intense the pressure situation is, there are always going to be three things that are certain. Number one is God's presence. I don't care what the circumstance looks like. His presence with you, that's certain. How can I be certain that he's with me because of the word? Romans chapter 8, verse 31 says, what shall we say to these things? If, and that if is not, is he, it's since, since God is for us, who can be against us? If God is on our side, what can stand against us and win? You have to remind yourself, I am not in this situation by myself. God, you're with me. His presence is always going to be certain. Number two, you have to remind yourself of God's love. God's love is always going to be certain. Romans chapter 8, verse 35, in the New King James Version, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, tribulation there is trouble, shall trouble, separate us from God's love, or distress, that word distress, there's pressure. Paul is saying, can pressure separate us from God's love, or persecution? Persecution is people talking about you. 
talking about you in your face, but also talking about you behind your back. He says, shall famine separate us from God's love? Famine is poor economic conditions. Shall nakedness, nakedness is I'm lacking some things financially. I'm lacking some things materially. Or peril, peril is any type of danger. Or sword, sword is, is times of war. War situations in the world. Paul says in verse 37, Romans 8, 37, yet in all of these things, in the danger, in the pressure, in the poor economic conditions, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Any adversity in, in life that you face is going to fall in one of those seven categories. I don't care what it is. I don't care what the pressure situation is. It's going to fall in one of those categories. And the Bible says, Scripture says, that none of those things can separate you from God's love. The enemy is going to tell you if God loved you, you wouldn't be going through it. He's going to tell you that you're in it by yourself. He's going to tell you that even if God sees what you're going through, he doesn't care enough to help you. You got to figure it out by yourself. I am saying that you have to remind yourself, God's love for me is still constant. You have to also remind yourself, number three, of God's ability. Here's what Jesus said in Mark 10, 27. Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. I may not see how I'm going to get through to the other side, but the Word says that with God... Me winning in this circumstance is possible. Yeah. Humility agrees with him. Amen. Humility says what he says. Humility doesn't talk circumstances. Humility talks the word. You have to remind yourself of what is certain. Number two, what does a winning response look like to pressure? You have to make sure that you're approaching the pressure situation with the right attitude. Somebody say the right attitude. the right attitude. Not a negative attitude, the right attitude. I'm going to remind myself of what is sure, what I can bank on, what I can take to the bank, but I also have to approach it with the right attitude. The wrong attitude, a negative attitude, believes that even God can't change it. Amen. A negative attitude believes... You may not even say it out of your mouth, but on the inside, God can't even handle this. This is so expensive, God can't even pay for it. That's the wrong attitude. That's the wrong attitude. That's the attitude that those spies over in Numbers 13 got over into. It's some big old boys over there in the promised land. Even God helping us can't help us to overcome them. A negative attitude sees the uncertainty. We're not sure how this is going to turn out. A negative attitude sees that uncertainty as bigger than the God in us. We're going to approach it with the right attitude. The right attitude chooses to believe God and what he says regardless of the circumstance. The right attitude sees the uncertainty. It doesn't deny the uncertainty, but it sees it as an opportunity. Okay, when God gets through showing out, this was a big situation, but this testimony is about to be huge. The right attitude sees it as an opportunity for a testimony. The right, the right attitude sees it as an opportunity for God to manifest his provision power, for God to manifest his healing power, for God to manifest his delivering power. I got to approach it with the right attitude, and you determine your attitude, not the devil. You determine your attitude, not God. God is going to help you, but he's not going to choose your attitude. You have to choose to approach the situation with the right attitude. 
Number three, we'll close here. What does a winning response look like? A winning response, if I'm gonna respond to this pressure properly, I gotta refuse to settle for my comfort zone. Oh, we're gonna have to work this one. I got 10 minutes. <laughs> I gotta work this one. Somebody say refuse, refuse. to settle, settle for my comfort zone. My comfort zone. Refuse, refuse to, settle to settle for my comfort zone. I got a lot of pressure on me. You got a lot of pressure on you. The temptation is gonna be to respond based on what you know. The temptation is gonna be to respond based on what you've always done. I did it this way in the past and it worked. So I'm gonna try that again in this situation. You're gonna be tempted to default on what you know. But remember, we've taken time to acknowledge the Holy Spirit. We weren't asking him for his help as a formality. We're expecting him to speak. I taught this lesson to our leaders last year because leaders have a lot of pressure. I meet with our staff leaders and our volunteer leaders every month. I taught this to our leaders last year. One of our leaders asked a good question. She said, okay, pastor, I heard you. You said that in between the trigger and the response, we should pause and pray. What if I find myself in a pressure situation? I don't have a lot of time to pause and pray. She said, she said what if I got to respond right then? What I told her and what I'll tell you is that's where your prayer life becomes critically important. Because here's how the Holy Spirit works. He sees ahead and provides. That's good. That's good. You exist in time. You can only see right now. Holy Spirit lives outside of time. He can see the pressure circumstance before you get in it. If you're spending quality time in prayer with him, Holy Spirit, talk to me about my present reality. Talk to me about my future. Jesus said, Jesus said, Jesus said, Michael K. didn't say, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will show you things to come. I may not, you may not in that moment always have this huge time to pause and pray. Acknowledge him. It doesn't take you but a second to do that. Holy Spirit, I need your help. Holy Spirit, I need you to lead me and guide me. But I promise you, I promise you, if you're spending quality time with him, yes, he's going to talk to you about the circumstance before you get in it. Journal what he tells you. Don't try to keep it in your head. Journal what he tells you. His job is to bring all things to your remembrance. You'll be in the circumstance, you're thinking, man, I gotta respond, I gotta respond, I gotta respond, and a flashing thought would just go across your mind. What he said back then, he was preparing us for it then. We're not praying just to check off a religious checkbox. We're praying because prayer is connected to us winning. Prayer is connected to our advantage. How does that connect, Pastor MK, though, to my comfort zone? Whenever the Holy Spirit speaks, we've acknowledged him, he's going to speak. He's going to instruct you. He's going to lead you. He's going to guide you. Usually, his instructions are going to be outside of your comfort zone. His instructions are often beyond anything that you've done in the past. His instructions will go beyond what you think in and of your own self you're capable of. I am saying that in that moment, I got a word from the Holy Spirit on how I need to respond to this, but this out there. 
I'm not comfortable with what he told me to do. And I already got all of this uncertainty around me. Come on, Holy Spirit. I am saying that you have to choose in that moment to obey him, even though it's uncomfortable. You got to choose to obey him, even though it does not make sense to your natural mind, because it's a good chance if it's from him, it won't. It's not a natural instruction. It's a supernatural instruction that's going to lead to a supernatural result. Holy Spirit, why would you tell me to sow when I need money? I'm trying to pay my bills and I already don't have enough. And you're going to tell me to take the little that I have and to sow it into her, to sow it into him. Holy Spirit, she doesn't need the money. I do. You're telling me to sow it into him. He has plenty of money. He doesn't need it. I am saying that in that moment, the Holy Spirit is not going to tackle you. He's not going to wrestle you down. He's going to speak, and you get to choose. Am I going to lean on my own understanding? That scripture is real cute till you get an instruction like that. Okay, but Holy Spirit, let me just, let me just make sure I heard you. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to give the money away and then realize that was just the pizza that I ate. You're taking time to pray. You're taking time to acknowledge him. Just because it's uncomfortable doesn't mean that it's the devil. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to say that again. Just because it's uncomfortable, I bind you, devil. I bind you, devil. Listen, the devil is not instructing you to give to nobody. He's not. He's not. The devil comes to steal. He is not trying to bless them through you. If you choose to move outside of your comfort zone, the Holy Spirit is going to lead you to two places. He's going to lead you to a place of growth. It's going to feel very unsafe obeying him, but you're not going to grow in your comfort zone. You can quote all the faith scriptures that you want. You're not going to grow in your faith until you obey him, even if it's uncomfortable. When you obey him, he's going to lead you to a place of growth, and he's going to lead you to a place of innovation. Nobody is responding to this situation like you. And nobody is responding that way on the job like you because you didn't make it up. It came from him. Because he's going to have you doing stuff that nobody else is doing. It's going to give you an advantage. It's going to make you look good. It's going to lead to your profit. Pharaoh in Egypt is feeling insecure. These Hebrew Israelites are growing I'm not sure that I can continue to lead if they keep growing like this. They can choose to rise up, rebel, overtake my throne. So generals, here's what we're going to do. We're going to mobilize our army to go from house to house, apartment to apartment, in the Hebrew camp. We're going to kill all the male babies, certain age down. Force birth control. We're going to kill them. The Bible says over in Hebrews chapter 11 that Moses' parents hid him by faith. 
if they're hiding Moses by faith, the Holy Spirit somewhere, Scripture doesn't tell us, somewhere has given his parents some instructions about him. I can't have faith where the will of God is not known. Somewhere he's told us what to do with this baby. The Holy Spirit's instructions don't make sense to our natural mind. His mom takes her baby. That's real cute when it's Moses. This is your baby. The baby that you went to the doctor's appointments for. The baby that you've been swaddling all this time. This is a real baby. And God tells you, take your baby, place him in a basket and put your baby in a river. My God today, my God today, I'm not gonna even ask you would you obey. That's uncomfortable. It's all kind of uncertainty in this river. This is a real river. It's real animals in this river. This is a real threat on our babies. This is highly uncertain. My kid making it is highly important. This is some tremendous pressure. But Moses' mom, in the middle of the pressure, refused to settle for her comfort zone. She chose to obey God, even though it didn't make sense. I can't see on the other side of this instruction. Holy Spirit, I don't know what you have planned, but if you tell me to put this kid in the Nile, I'm going to put him in this basket. I'm going to send him down float. His mom obeys God. God favors Moses, causes not just anybody to see him. Pharaoh's daughter the daughter of the most powerful man on the planet. Plenty of security, plenty of money, best education in the world. Pharaoh's daughter sees this baby, recognizes that it's a Hebrew baby, but I am going to choose to use my influence, my power, my advantages, my resources, on his behalf. Moses' sister shows up, hey, do you need somebody to watch the baby? I know somebody who can watch the baby. Yeah, I need somebody to watch the baby, cool. Let me go get my mama who obeyed God. Let me go get my mama who refused to settle for her comfort zone. I'm gonna bring my mama to you. Pharaoh's daughter says, hey, if you'll take care of this strange baby, I don't know where it came from. If you will take care of him, if you will nurse him, if you will watch him, I will not just reward you, I will pay you. I will put you on the payroll to take care of your baby. Come on, God. Come on, God. I'm not just going to save him. I'm not just going to save your baby. I'm going to cause you to come up. I'm going to send your baby to private school. Your baby gonna eat the best. You taking care of my adopted baby, so I'm gonna make sure you good. We know how the story turned out. I am saying that the same God who was present with Moses' mom is present with you. The same God who loved his mom loves you, the same God who was able not just to save Moses, but to provide for him, to protect him, to keep him, to pay his mama to take care of him, is the same Jehovah Jireh. Somebody say it's my winning season. Somebody say it's my winning season. Right now. Right now. now. The results that we're going to get, and I'm closing. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. The results that we're going to get are going to be so beyond us. We can't even take credit for it if we try. 
That's so supernatural. Yeah. How are you going to pay me? I ain't got to buy no diapers. Egypt is buying them. Egypt buying the car seat. Egypt paying for all my insurance bills. That was so far beyond what she could have done on her own. It was supernatural. But it's not a different God, y'all. It's not a different God. He doesn't love them in the scriptures more than he loves you. They didn't even have, they didn't, Jesus hadn't even yet died for them. He shed his blood for you. Somebody say, I have an advantage. Somebody say, I have an advantage. We're not going to just know it. We're going to take advantage of our advantage. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen.